good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening service. Um, last Sunday evening, I did a Bible study that uh, kind of goes along with what we were studying the last couple weeks in Revelation chapter 2 on the church of Thyatira, uh, where it talks about that woman, Jezebel. And we went back to Matthew 13, 33, which I have made reference to uh, during our Wednesday evening Bible study, and we went into more depth on that. I encourage you to take a look at that uh, Bible study lesson, and uh, I hope you find it helpful and encouraging and, and uh, informational uh, to you, educational as well. Uh, but tonight we move on, and we are starting... Uh, according to the notes, this is lesson eight, so it is taking us several weeks to get through each lesson, but uh, uh, we'll be starting in Revelation chapter three, and uh, we won't make it all the way through the first six verses, but let's go ahead and read those, starting in verse one, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast the name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your instructions and messages, uh, your encouragement and warnings to these seven churches. Lord, may we learn from them. And God, where the warnings apply to us, May we heed them, especially when you when you call upon us to repent. May we do just that and turn back to you. We pray that you'll bless the study of your word. May it draw us closer to Christ and help us to learn more of him. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Uh, all right. We're going to jump right in here. Uh, verse 1. And we're going to study some things uh, historically about the city of Sardis. And... Uh, to get some background, some kind of uh, some information uh, as far as context here. Uh, as I mentioned, I believe it was Sunday night, maybe it was uh, Sunday morning, I mentioned this, that, that different places have things that are unique to them. It was in the Sunday night Bible study. Uh, it's more of a Bible study than a sermon. And I said different countries are known for different things. And <clears throat> so... Uh, and a lot of times, for example, Colombia, South America, for a long time was known for its coffee. Uh, then also in some, in some circles it was known for its drugs. Um, but a lot of people don't know that Colombia also exports a lot of roses. Uh, some of the best emeralds in the world are found in Colombian mines. And uh, so there's some things that, that they have they're not known for, and some things that they have that they are known for worldwide. Uh, but uh, so it's good to know some things about the city or about the location, about the area, and that uh, that gives us some some insight into the message that is going to the people in that area. Uh, Sardis is the fifth church out of the seven that received letters uh, <clears throat> in the great circle of the seven churches in Asia. The messenger carries the letter to Ephesus, and then he goes north to Smyrna. Uh, from there, he goes further north to the city of Pergamos. Uh, from Pergamos, he turns back south and somewhat to the east and reaches Thyatira. And then he continues on south to the city of Sardis. Sardis is about 30 miles from Thyatira. Um, uh, and that would also put it about 60 miles from Pergamos and uh, uh, from Smyrna about 50 miles uh, east uh, from there. Uh, it is the name of one of the noblest and greatest and most storied of all the cities of the East. There's a lot of things that went on there, and it is uh, uh, very historically significant. Um, for more than 2,000 years, it was a very famous city under successive empires. 
It was first introduced as the capital uh, of the ancient city of the kingdom of Lydia. And the king there, and a lot of these names I assume are Greek, uh, which makes them Greek to me. So I'm not sure about the pronunciation of them. I'm going to I'm going to call him uh, King Croesus. That's C R O E S U S, and that's probably not the right pronunciation. And I apologize for that. But uh, uh, I'm not from that part of the world, and so, uh, uh, anyways, King Croesus, and his name was pretty much synonymous with riches and wealth. Uh, <clears throat> Sardis was not only famous for its rich men. It was also famous for its very educated and wise uh, men as well. A man by the name of Thales, who was a Greek philosopher, was a citizen of Sardis. Uh, Solon, uh, who's another name uh, for uh, another very wise legislator, uh, lived for a while in Sardis. Uh, Xerxes decided to prepare his mammoth conflict with the kingdom of, of Elis, and he massed his vast forces at Sardis. So he, he, he gathered everybody together there, and from there he went on. Uh, one of the most brilliant uh, historical accounts on the city of Sardis is told by the Greek historian Herodotus, and it talks about the topography, or, or focuses in on the topography of that city. Uh, there's an incident that happened there when Cyrus, the king of the Medo-Persians, was besieging uh, Croesus, or Croesus, I'm not sure how that's, King Croesus was, was besieged by Cyrus. And so Croesus was, was locked up in the citadel of the city, of the capital city. And Sardis was considered uh, a fortress that uh, you couldn't get into, impregnable fortress. And just the way it was built, it was built on the slope of Mount Tuolus. And at the base of that slope was a, was a very large river, gold-bearing river, uh, named uh, the river Pactolos. Um, <clears throat> and so it's that they used the topography to their advantage in building the city for protection. Keep in mind, in, in those days, they couldn't call in air support and have jets fly over and drop bombs on the places. If, if you were to, to attack a city, you arrived on horseback or on foot. Uh, at best, if you had elephants available, you could bring them along, but uh, they didn't fare so good going up a mountainside. And so um, here is a city uh, of Sardis, like a pier, jutting out from Mount Tuolus. And it's like a ridge of rock with great cliffs on either side. So it made it, it, made it a little easier for that city to be defended. Uh, and so on that pier of solid rock, which is very high up on this mountainside, Sardis had built its citadel. And so when Cyrus decided to besiege the city, he couldn't advance further until that fortress was taken. And, and so he, he, was, he tried and he tried and he tried. The Persian general offered uh, large rewards to anyone who would storm the fortress and overwhelm it. And, and, and nobody was able to do so. There was uh, in his army a Mardian soldier by the name of, and I'm going to make this, this one wrong also, higher higher oides or something like that. We'll call him higher. Uh, <laughs> and one day he's, he's standing, he's watching the cliff, and he's looking up at the, at the citadel of Cyrus, built up there on that cliff, and, and uh, as he's watching, one of the soldiers up there leans over the battlement. He leans over the, the, the wall, and as he's leaning over, his helmet falls off. And so he decides to climb over the battlement and make his way down. His, I mean, his helmet just bounces and rolls on down and rolls on down and rolls on down to, uh, uh, to the base of the cliff. And so the, the Lydian soldier, the man who is, is uh, <clears throat> inside the, uh, the protection of, of the battlement, he climbs over and... He picks his way very slowly down to the base of the cliff to recover his helmet. And then he climbs back up the same way that he came down. Now this Mardian soldier, we're going to call him Hyer. Uh, it's H-Y-E-R-O-E-A-D-E-S. Hyer Oedes. Anyway, Hyer is easier to say. He watches him. 
and he watches that Lydian soldier come all the way down, and he watches him go all the way back up. And that night, he picks, he handpicks some some soldiers, some Persian soldiers. Uh, we might say special forces uh, or their equivalent of that. And he go, he works his way up that same way that the Lydian soldier had come down and gone back up. He, he, those people that lived there, they knew their way up and down that mountain. They knew the places that could be uh, ascended and the places that could not be. And, and he found that this was a kind of like a secret passageway to get up there. He found it was completely unguarded. Now this is key. He's got a handful of men with him. There's been a great reward offered by Cyrus for anybody who can take the city of Sardis and, and uh, cause it to fall so they can continue moving on uh, in their conquest. And so he's made his way up there. And as I said, he finds it completely unguarded and that's the way Sardis fell to the hands of the Persians. Now, with that in mind and, and the topography can be seen and as, as we as we have that in mind have the topography in mind what we see is the emphasis of our Lord when he says be watchful be watchful he says if thou wilt not watch I will come on thee as a thief there's ruins of a Christian building here people have called it the Church of St. John and perhaps John was the one who, who planted Christianity here. We, we're, not, we're not positive about that, but it's, it's very possible. The word Sardis, the word Sardis means escaping ones or those who come out. And remember, we've been looking at the churches and, and each church has a different set of of problems that they deal with. They have different strengths and different weaknesses. And then those churches, I believe, also signify or represent different time periods. And so we're getting into the, the fifth time period covered by the, by the different churches here. And so the Church of Sardis would cover the history in, in Christendom called, that, that we call the Reformation. And it started about 1517 and went on through 1750. And Reformation, think of that as, as groups of people that kind of got fed up within the Catholic Church. We talked uh, uh, quite a bit last week, and then Sunday night, I, I didn't mention the Catholic Church by name, but uh, you can look at the descriptions and, and listen to that Bible study and know that's the one that matches. But, uh, and we'll get into that. Uh, in much greater depth as we move along in the book of Revelation here, uh, what's going on there. But anyways, people got fed up from within the Catholic Church, and they thought, well, and they've been taught, keep in mind, they've been taught and brainwashed their entire life to identify that church as Christianity. And they started reading their Bibles, and they said, well, the church, and that's all that, you know, to say the church well, that was the only church that was recognized, pretty much. I mean, there was, there was always been Bible churches around somewhere, uh, but the church, meaning the Catholic church, persecuted them and tried to uh, knock them out of existence. And they were the ones recognized by governments everywhere. But anyways, and so they, they said, we've got, to, we've got to reform it. We need to reform it. Now, now listen to me. God never sent us into the world to reform false religions. His message for those that are in a false religion has always been, come out from among them. When you get saved, you, you got saved out of a false belief system. Now, it may have been a, an organized belief system, or it may have been just a belief system you came up with, but it was a false belief system, and you repented of that belief system, and you repented to believing in Christ. In other words, some people, they, they've gone to church their whole lives, and they've been taught, well, you had some water poured on your head as a baby, so you're going to heaven. 
And if you were asked, if you were to ask them if, if they thought they were going to go to heaven, they'd say, yeah. And you'd say, well, what makes you think that? And they'd say, well, I had some water poured on my head when I was a baby. Now, God says, that's not how you get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so that person needs to turn from their false belief system, the, their belief system of, I'm trusting in some water being poured on my head to get me into heaven. They need to turn from that and turn to believing in Jesus and what he did for them on the cross of Calvary when he died and shed his blood. And then three days later when he rose again from the dead, victorious over the grave. And when they, when they take their faith and they were placing it in the wrong place and they take that back and say, I'm going to place it in the right place now, that's repentance unto salvation. And so, uh, false belief system. God never told us to, to try to reform false belief system. He told us to proclaim the truth. And when people turn from their false belief system to the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, they turn to Jesus, then they're supposed to come out and be separate and just leave it. But these men decided, see, they loved their church. And they thought, it's just been some, some bad people got in control and they corrupted it. No, folks, they didn't corrupt it. It was always in that state. It was always wrong. It was never a good system. It was maybe at best a system that didn't look as bad as what they saw, but it was never Christianity. It was never Christ-based. They've, stole, they've taken a lot of glory away from Christ and given it to Mary. They've taken a lot of glory away from Christ and bestowed it upon people that they have determined to be saints. Now the Bible says that anybody that is a born-again child of God, they're a saint. You don't have to perform miracles and you don't have to do things and have the church, the church, recognize you as somebody that's, that's phenomenal. God is the one that declares us to be saints and our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, so, Jesus says, be watchful, be watchful. And, and that word sardis means escaping ones. And the time period that this church represents is the time period of the Reformation, uh, from 1517 to about 1750. In the midst of that great spiritual darkness, there were those who who escaped and they they broke they wound up it's kind of arguable did they really break off no they didn't really break off they wanted to stay and recreate the catholic church and the catholic church says that's not what we're about and what they did was they kicked them out and these men became known as protesters or they led the group of Protestants, Protestants, Protestants. Baptists are not Protestants. We were never a part of the Catholic Church to begin with. We didn't protest them and get kicked out. We existed before them and alongside, but never were under their umbrella. Now, your other religions, most denominations are Protestant denominations. Uh, your Methodists are Protestant denominations. The Nazarenes broke off from the Methodists, so you trace their roots back. They are a Protestant denomination. The Lutherans are a Protestant denomination. The Anglicans and the Presbyterians and, and many, many, many others. Now, not all denominations are Protestant. Some, there are others that were never part of the Catholic Church. They just kind of sprung up out here on their own. Um, but they cannot, truce, they, they cannot trace their roots back to the church that Jesus started in Jerusalem the way that, that, uh, that the Baptist church can. Now, if you want some good information on that, there's a nice little booklet. You can get it for uh, a few dollars online, and it's called The Trail of Blood. And, and that, that chronicles the history of the Baptist church all the way back to Jerusalem. Now, among those who escaped, remember... The word Sardis means escaping ones. And among those who escaped or broke out of the Catholic Church or were kicked out of the Catholic Church, those who come out, that's another definition for the name Sardis. Uh, you can look up the name Luther, Knox, Wycliffe, 
uh, uh, I'll spell this one, Z-W-I-N-G-L-I, -I. I'm assuming that's Zwingli, and there's others, and you'll find many of them mentioned also in that booklet, The Trail of Blood. There had, the, the control of the, the papacy had reached an intolerable level, and it, it peaked on October 31st, 1517. And that was when Martin Luther took his 95 theses. He had some questions that he wanted to he wanted the Catholic Church to answer. And by the way, it was a Baptist that took Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, and took him to the Bible and showed him the verse that says, The just shall live by faith. And here was a Catholic priest who his entire life had been taught that if you wanted to be justified, it would take your good works. And when he was confronted with that scripture, he turned away from that belief and trusting in, the, in his works and in that uh, system of things to do and put his faith in Jesus and got saved. Uh, and he should have just left, but he said, well, I'm a priest in the Catholic Church. I need to reform them and change them. And so he, he, he started reading his Bible and saw now with the Holy Spirit inside him, saw the truth in the Word of God and said, well, that doesn't match what, remember, they would say the church. They would just say the church. I'm going to put that in quotes because it's not a, a, a biblical church, but um, he said, I'm just going to, it doesn't match up. The church that I'm in doesn't match what the Bible says. And so he wrote down these questions. And then if you had a proclamation that you wanted everybody in that city to know about, you would nail it to the door of the church. And so he took this, it's called 95 Theses, and he nailed it to the door of the church. And boy, that started a big stink. His voice resounded throughout the entire German Empire. And the Lutheran church is still the official church in the country of Germany there. And there's many that his voice found a response in. And they had become very weary and tired of the Catholic Church as well. Um, let's let's move on here. Um, well, let's see here. We're gonna we're gonna read verse one. It says, "Unto the angel, remember that's that's the messenger or the pastor of the church in Sardis, right? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know that works." Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Uh, he that hath the seven spirits of God. The next Wednesday night, Lord willing, we will look into that and what that uh, what that symbolizes and the uh, the significance of it. Let's close tonight with a word of prayer. Our heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, its perfection. God, as we study not just what's in your word, but what your word was in, what it was addressing and talking about, as we study the, even just the topography of Sardis and, and we, in the history of it, we can learn some things uh, that you're making reference to here in your word. Help us to, most importantly, learn more of Jesus and to draw closer to him. For we ask it all in his name. Amen. Lord bless you.